Thank you. That concludes general questions. We turn to First Minister's questions. Question number one from Jackson Carlo. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, yesterday, Derek Mackay once again complained about the UK Government's block grant for Scotland next year. Uh, other than our Finance Secretary, who else in Scotland is claiming that the money he receives from Westminster will go down next year? First Minister. Well, in, in my experience, people the length and breadth of Scotland are complaining about Tory austerity yeah. and Tory cuts to the budget of this government. The money, of course, that Jackson Carlow claims uh, is extra in the Scottish budget. Firstly, most of that is for the NHS, which we more than pass on to the NHS. The rest, and perhaps Jackson Carlow wants to, to listen to this, but most of the rest uh, comes from a capital uplift relating to changes in how network rail is funded. It doesn't translate into any additional investment whatsoever. The fact is, Derek Mackay set out in Parliament yesterday are these. Uh, money available uh, to us for everything other than health is down by £340 million. That's 1.3% in real terms just in this year. And over the decade, Tory austerity uh, has taken £2 billion out of this government's budget. That is 7% in real terms. And when you consider that, I think the fact that Derek Mackay yesterday it managed a three-quarters of a billion increase for the National Health Service, real terms protection for local government, real terms protection for the education portfolio, more spending on the limited areas of welfare uh, that we are responsible for than we inherited from the UK government. I think Derek Mackay has done a very, very good job indeed. Jackson Carla. Well, once again, nice excerpts from our big book of Voldemort's excuses, but not actually, <laughs> not actually, not actually an answer to the question I put. Because the Fraser of Allender Institute says the block grant is going up. The Scottish Fiscal Commission says it's going up. The Scottish Parliament's Information Service says it's going up. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's just a pity that typically the First Minister refuses to acknowledge that. Even her own budget document shows that it's going up yeah. by over half a billion pounds. So let's give her another chance. Let's give her another chance. In a further boast yesterday, Mr Mackay claimed that 99% of Scotland's taxpayers will pay less tax next year than this. Yeah. Can the First Minister tell us who is mostly responsible for this welcome tax cut? Is it Derek Mackay or is it Philip Hammond? First Minister. I have to, I'm sorry to, to disappoint Jackson Garlow. I didn't even have to get to page one of my big book uh, because his questions weren't uh, that testing uh, for me. And even now, I'm not going to have to open. Uh, the fact of the matter is, it, it's, not just, it's not just the fact that, yes, 99% of taxpayers in Scotland uh, will pay less tax uh, this year, next year than they do this year. Uh, due to the decisions of Derek Mackay, 55% of taxpayers in Scotland uh, will pay less tax yep. than their counterparts yep. in the rest of yep. the UK, yep. making Scotland, of course, the fairest yeah. tax part yeah. of the UK. And of course, what, what is really, what is really, really irritating Jackson Carlaw today is that we have chosen, we have chosen not to give a tax cut to higher rate taxpayers like him. We have an increased tax for higher rate taxpayers. We've just chosen not to reduce it. Now, I know Jackson Carlaw uh, wants us to match the tax cut for higher rate taxpayers in the rest of the UK. So I'll give him this invitation again, which he didn't take up last week. Maybe he will do so now. If we were to do that, it would cost half a billion pounds. Five hundred million pounds. Now, when he replied to Derek Mackay yesterday, Murdo Fraser, I can immediately see Murdo Fraser probably hiding, <laughs> hiding up the back. Not only did he call for us to spend an extra half a billion pounds cutting tax for higher rate taxpayers, he also seemed to call for us to spend an extra billion pounds on local government. So can Jackson Carlaw just explain to me right now, where in the budget does he want us to take the money? Is it from health? Is it from education? Is it from local government? I am waiting with bated breath for the answer to that question. Jackson Carlaw. 
I'm actually here to ask questions, but what I will do is... No, let's, let's turn to it, because in the Scottish, Scotland's economic and fiscal forecast, December 2018, it says, we expect Derek Mackay's decisions yesterday to start to have an effect on tax residency decisions in Scotland. You can't tax people who aren't coming to Scotland to tax, First Minister. If you start to ensure that residency decisions are taken by those people we need in our hospitals to fill consultancy vacancies, if you start to take decisions that affect the number of employers we have, then you won't have higher tax rate payers here that you can continue to tax the way that you currently do. But let's return. I asked two questions and I failed to get two answers because the answer, of course, was that it's Mr Hammond who has reduced taxation. Yeah. According to the Scottish Government's own figures, from April next year, a household with an income of £15,000 a year will get a tax cut of £130.49. £130 of that much-deserved tax break break is because of the decision by the UK government to increase the tax-free personal allowance. So how much of that tax break will be down to the Scottish Government's budget announced yesterday? All of 49 pence. That's the real difference between these benches. A £130 tax cut for low-paid workers delivered by the Conservatives while the SNP give them the price of a packet of crisps. So let me give the First Minister one last chance to see if she can be straight with people today. Again yesterday, Mr Mackay, again yesterday, Mr Mackay boasted that in 2018 the economy was predicted to grow in Scotland at a faster rate than the UK as a whole. So First Minister, great news if it's true. However, according to the Scottish Fiscal Commission, in how many of the following years is this also predicted to be the case? Yeah. First Minister is already growing faster this year than the economy in the rest of the UK. And that wasn't predicted a year or so ago. So I'm not entirely sure that Jackson Carlaw's uh, question in that regard takes them very far. But let me return to some of his other questions. He, he talks a lot about the personal allowance. Can I gently remind Jackson Carlaw, the personal allowance is reserved yeah. to the UK government and they oppose the devolution of that. He also talks... He also talks about behavioural impacts. If he read the Scottish Fiscal Commission uh, reports a bit more closely, uh, he would see that the numbers fully take account of any predicted behavioural impact. And even taking account of that, Derek Mackay's decision to freeze the higher rate threshold rather than increase it with inflation uh, raises £68 million in the next financial year. So if Jackson Carlaw doesn't want us to do that, he has to tell us where that £68 million should come from. And if he wants us to go further and match uh, the tax cut of Philip Hammond, he has to tell us where the £500 million uh -huh. is going to come from. But since he likes comparisons, uh, let me give him a few. Murdo Fraser again yesterday was talking about public sector workers. So let me give him a few illustrations of the differences between Scotland and the rest of the UK. Uh, and these illustrations take account of the Scottish Government's tax plans and the Scottish Government's pay policy. So an NHS porter at the top of Agenda for Change Band 2 will be £800 better off in Scotland than if they worked in NHS England. Ooh. A radiographer uh, will be £380 better off in Scotland. A new start police officer... A new start police officer will be four and a half thousand pounds better off in Scotland. A police constable at the top of their scale, they're going to be 1,200 pounds better off in Scotland than in the rest of the UK. And lastly, in terms of the illustrations, let's take a paramedic working hard in our ambulance service, 400 pounds better off in Scotland than if they worked in the rest of the UK. So I think this budget is a good deal. Of course, all of that it doesn't even take account of the fact that if you live and work in Scotland, uh, your children don't have to pay £9,000 a year to go to university. Your elderly relative doesn't have to pay for personal care. Taxpayers in Scotland, at whatever amount they earn, get a far better deal under this government, and long may it continue. Jackson Carlow. It is so long ago that I asked my question, I might just remind the Chamber of what it was. Yeah. I, asked the, I asked the First Minister, 
in how many of the following years the Scottish Fiscal Commission predicted that economic growth would be greater in Scotland? The First Minister didn't answer that because the answer is none. Yeah. In every year from 2019 until 2023, Scotland's growth rate is predicted by the Scottish Fiscal Commission to be lower than the UK as a whole. Scotland in the slow lane with the SNP. But, presiding officer, it's no surprise we don't get answers from this First Minister. She simply prefers to shout abuse from the sidelines. Yeah. Stoking up her indignation. Yeah. Yeah. Stoking up her indignation this week to berate the Prime Minister. This from the same First Minister. From the same First Minister, who for the last year and a half has dangled Scotland in a thread as she's danced and dodged around her deeply divisive second independence yeah. referendum. Double standards. Double standards and hypocrisy, aren't they the hallmarks of this SNP government? Yeah. First Minister. Jack Jackson Carlaw, embarrassingly for him, talks about people shouting abuse. Yeah. Tory MPs have spent the week shouting abuse at each other <laughs> while they plunge this entire country into chaos and crisis. But let's go back to uh, the GDP figures and the performance of Scotland's economy. The point I was making about Jackson Carlaw's questions about forecast GDP growth is if you wind the clock back, uh, the figures wouldn't have predicted that our economy was growing faster than the UK's in this year. And yet our economy is growing faster than the UK's in this year. Scotland's GDP outperforming the UK in the first six months of this year. Scotland's unemployment rate uh, at the lowest rate on record and lower than any of the other UK nations. Scotland's exports increasing faster than in any other UK nation. And of course, we continue to be the best part of the UK outside of London when it comes to attracting foreign direct investment. So an economy that is doing better, a budget that is fairer and gives a better deal to people hardworking in our public sector and across our private sector. That's what you get when you get real strong and stable government in Scotland <laughs> with the SNP. And what, what a welcome contrast to the utter shambles that the Tories are presiding over at Westminster. Thank you. First, turn to question two. Can you just say that was uh, 12 and a half minutes for that opening exchange? That is too long. That is too long. And I would expect succinct questions, succinct answers from now on. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer, yesterday Derek Mackay said that the Scottish Government will continue to mitigate the worst impacts of the Tory Government's social security cuts. Is the two child cap on tax credits and universal credit not one of the worst impacts? First Minister. Well, as Richard Leonard knows, this government does everything it can to mitigate uh, UK welfare cuts. Uh, we are spending in the region of £100 million every year to do that. Uh, the fact that we cannot mitigate every cut is not a lack of political will. It's a fact of basic arithmetic. Uh, we don't hold the budget for reserved areas of welfare, so every penny of mitigation has to come from another area of our responsibilities. As the UN Special Rapporteur on Poverty said uh, just a, a few weeks ago, and I'm quoting, uh, devolved administrations have tried to mitigate the worst impacts of austerity, but mitigation comes at a price and is not sustainable. So I would say to Richard Leonard again, if he wants us not simply to mitigate UK government Tory welfare cuts, but to stop them at source. Will he join with me today uh, and ask for all of those powers over welfare to be devolved to this parliament? That's the real answer. Why won't Richard Leonard back it? Richard Leonard. <laughs> Presiding officer, here are the facts. This parliament has the power to mitigate the two child cap. And that would immediately benefit 3,780 families across Scotland, some by over £2,500 per child per year. The urgent issue for these families is not which parliament sets social security policy, it's whether their kids go to bed hungry tonight and whether they can clothe them tomorrow morning. It would just cost 0.2% of the Scottish budget to deliver. 
So why won't you act? First Minister. I'm going to, I'm going to make a, a genuine offer to Richard Leonard uh, right now, and I hope it's one that he takes seriously. Uh, Derek Mackay, when he set out the budget yesterday, fully allocated all of the resources uh, that the Scottish Government has at our disposal. I know uh, Labour thought we had kept £300 million in a reserve, but they misread the budget. We'd actually taken £300 million out of reserve to spend on public services. So we've used our tax powers uh, and we've allocated all of the resources at our disposal. Uh, we've chosen to invest in the health service, in education, local government, in welfare. Now, my offer to Richard Leonard is, of course, there's many other things I would love to have the money to do. So if Richard Leonard wants us to spend money on other things, then he has to come to us. We'll help him cost these things, because we know from uh, comments from his colleagues this week that they have difficulty in Labour costing their proposals. It will help him cost them, but once they're costed, if he wants to have any credibility and to be taken seriously, he has to tell us where in the draft budget he wants that money to come from. Is it the health investment? Is it local government? Uh, is it other areas of welfare? So that's an offer to Richard Leonard. If he tells us that, we will listen seriously. Let's see if Labour are prepared to step up to the plate. Richard Leonard. Well, Derek Mackay said yesterday the choice is either reducing public services or taxing more of the lowest earners. What about taxing more of the highest earners? <laughs> Presiding officer, this comes down in the end to what this parliament was created for in the first place. It should be a platform to lift people out of poverty. And there is a precedent for this. In 2014, this parliament came together to mitigate the impact of the bedroom tax in Scotland. And the SNP said then that it couldn't be done. They said then that they didn't want to let Westminster off the hook. First Minister, this is about lifting children out of poverty, not letting the Tories off the hook. So why don't you do it? First Minister. Well, as uh, we uh, have just heard in the exchange I've just had with Jackson Carlaw, uh, we are asking already higher rate taxpayers in Scotland to pay a bit more than they would if they lived elsewhere in the UK. That is fair and reasonable. Richard Leonard, well, I hear top earners. All of the assessment, all of the modelling suggests that because of behavioural changes, if we were to raise top rate, and we have raised the top rate, but if we were to do it more, then that could lose us revenue. And even if Richard Leonard, this is a serious budgetary point, even if Richard Leonard doesn't agree with that, even if I don't agree with that, if that's what the Scottish Fiscal Commission says, then we don't have that money to spend. You know, anybody who knows anything about budgeting uh, must know uh, that. Of course, as a source from Labour said this week, uh, that they don't even have a plan. At least when we had a plan, ridiculous as it was, we had a plan. Now we have nothing, it's a shambles. That comes from Labour's own benches. But I will make the offer again. We've got some weeks now before Parliament has to decide on this budget. If Richard Leonard, and I would love to do this, what he's suggesting around the two-child cap, but we don't have the money. So if I'm making, I am making a serious offer here, if Labour, Richard Leonard and his finance spokesperson come to me and Derek Mackay and say, we think you should take the money from this area of the budget or that area of the budget, I will listen. So the offer is there for Richard Leonard. We've allocated all the money in the budget. If he wants to spend more, well, he has to tell us how much his tax proposals will spend. We heard this week they don't have a tax plan in Labour. So the offer is there. I say again, let's see if Labour are going to step up to the plate over the next few weeks. Quite a number of requests for supplementaries. The first from Willie Coffey to be followed by Mike Rumbles. Thank you, President Officer. I've recently been contacted by my constituent Laura Nanny, an EU citizen who's lived in Scotland for over 30 years. Although Laura has lived in Scotland all of her work and life, the Department for Work and Pensions has determined she has no right to reside in the UK. What can the First Minister and the Scottish Government do to help European Union citizens residing in Scotland? who have wrongfully been denied universal credit through the habitual residency test. First Minister. Well, this is a shameful uh, 
circumstance, the right to reside test is applied to low-income benefits reserved to the UK government. It is a complex barrier for EU nationals that the UK deems, quote, economically inactive. Uh, the European Commission has described this test as, and I'm quoting, direct discrimination based on nationality. Uh, I can advise the Chamber that we are taking a more humane approach for our new Best Start grant uh, because the Scottish system is defined by dignity, fairness and respect. We value EU nationals and we will not subject them to needless stress, anxiety and financial hardship. Uh, EU nationals in Lauda's position, of course, uh, may also be eligible for the Scottish Welfare Fund. Uh, the UK system increasingly is known for two things inhumanity and incorrect decisions. So I would advise Laura to seek independent advice uh, on whether there might be a case for appeal. Uh, and I would encourage members across the chamber uh, to continue to press the UK government to scrap universal credit and to start having a welfare policy overall that's based on dignity, uh, respect, and above all else, humanity, because the current system is definitely not. Mike Rumbles to be followed by Bob Doris. With a written answer published yesterday, the government has made no mention of any new vessels for the Gurukh to Dunan ferry service, or indeed has any attempt been made to give any assurance to long-suffering passengers that they may act, might actually have any prospect of receiving an adequate service as they've had to put up with a record level of cancellations and repeated delays on this route. First Minister, when is the Scottish Government going to provide a decent service on this route? First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government is committed to providing uh, not just decent but good services on all of our ferry routes, including uh, Dunoon Guruk. Uh, in my previous ministerial roles, uh, the Dunoon Guruk ferry service was uh, something I was very closely uh, involved in. I will ask the Transport uh, Minister to write to the member specifically on the current situation, and I'm sure he'd be happy to meet with uh, him and constituents to discuss any concerns that they have fully. Bob Doris to be followed by Liam Kerr. Uh, First Minister, news broke yesterday that Gemini Rail Services plan to close its Springburn site with the loss of up to 200 jobs in my constituency. A devastating blow for the workforce, our communities and our proud locomotive industry with the St Rollock site itself dating back to 1856. I've spoken to Unite and to the company who leased the site to Gemini Rail. Whilst there is anger and concern, there's also a determination, First Minister, to save jobs and continue to see a future for the site. Will the First Minister commit to bringing together all relevant parties, including Gemini Rail, trade unions and Scottish Enterprise, to do all we can to secure the future of as many jobs as possible at this historic site? And the Scottish Government has shown a strong willingness to act in such circumstances previously. Will it act now, not just for the workers themselves and for my constituents, but also for the strategic interests of the Scottish economy? First Minister. Well, can I thank Bob Doris for raising this issue? And uh, yes, I will uh, ask the Transport uh, Minister to bring uh, all interested parties together in the way that he describes. Uh, the Scottish Government learned of this development only through the media. And let me say, I am extremely disappointed that that is the case. Officials met with the new owners last week, uh, but no reference was made on any immediate plans to make such an announcement. Uh, the Scottish Government, of course, will continue to engage constructively with the owners in the interests of the staff affected and the overall Scottish economy. And we're committed to supporting rail services and, of course, have made record investment in rail in recent years. Uh, the market for refurbishment of older uh, rolling stock is challenging, but there does remain opportunities to bid uh, for future work. So uh, I will ask the Transport Secretary uh, to uh, convene interested parties and, of course, uh, ask Bob Doris to be part of these discussions. Liam Kerr to be followed by Andy Whiteman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It has emerged the £218 million from the Aberdeen City Region deal to slash train times to the Central Belt by 20 minutes will only deliver two minutes. Certainly, it won't track the Yusan Junction, which was first promised by the SNP uh, to the North East in 2008 and reheated in 2016. So what reassurances can the First Minister give that the 20 minute claims were sufficiently evidenced in advance and that the City Region deal funding will generate real improvements for rail customers in Aberdeen. First Minister. Well, again, uh, at risk of keeping him very busy, I'll ask the Transport Minister to write uh, in terms of the specifics of the, the evidence behind uh, the 20 minute uh, issue. Uh, in terms of the question overall, uh, we are absolutely committed to ensuring continuing uh, improvement for rail passengers in every part of the country. And as 
Derek Mackay made clear uh, in the budget yesterday, we are also committed uh, to city region deals, not just the existing city region deals, but seeing uh, such deals uh, rolled out across other parts of the country because they do offer uh, huge potential for improvements, not just in transport, but in other areas of the economy as well. Andy Whiteman to be followed by Christine Graham. Uh, yesterday's budget states that investment in social care and integration will increase to over 700 million next year. However, last Thursday, the Pilton Community Health Project in North Edinburgh was told its funding would be cut when the Edinburgh IGB meets tomorrow. This is Scotland's oldest community health project where folk have worked tirelessly to tackle social isolation and reduce health inequalities in one of the country's most deprived areas. With 40 staff at risk of losing their job, can I ask the First Minister what support the Scottish Government can provide in light of yesterday's budget to ensure that this funding decision is reconsidered? Well, can I thank Andy Whitman for raising this issue. These are, uh, of course, uh, local decisions. This is a local decision, although I understand the concern that has been expressed about Pilton Community Health Project. Um, as I understand it, the Edinburgh Integration Joint Board will consider uh, the recommendations from the Health and Social Care Grants Programme Steering Group on the 14th of this month and make a decision on future funding uh, for all of the projects who applied. Uh, in these circumstances, I hope Andy Whiteman would uh, accept that it would not be appropriate for me to comment on an individual application until this meeting has taken place. Uh, but I will ask the Health Secretary to update him uh, once things have progressed further. Christine Graham, to be followed by Gail Ross. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the tragic death of my constituent, Amanda Cox, who, having given birth to a premature son, after visiting him in the special baby unit at the Royal Edinburgh Infirmary on Monday, became disorientated. Missing for seven hours, it was not until after 10pm she was found in a disused part of the hospital, seriously ill. She died shortly after. It's a dreadful tragedy for the family, and there's a small child now without a mother. There is an internal inquiry and the PF has issued a report. However, just this morning I've heard from Michael, her husband, that the hospital administration has requested a meeting with him to discuss a review of processes. This man is grieving and traumatised, and to me this is highly inappropriate and looks like face-saving. Can I therefore ask the First Minister if the Cabinet Secretary for Health will keep a very close watching brief on this matter and in the meantime confirm to the Chamber that none of our hospitals have processes which would let people down in such a tragic manner? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I say that my thoughts and sympathies are very much with Amanda Cox's family at this uh, extremely sad time for them. This is a, an absolutely tragic uh, situation and of course our thoughts are with all of our family but in particular with her husband and her little boy who of course remains in hospital. NHS Lothian are assisting uh, the police with their investigation into the circumstances of this tragic case. In addition to the police investigation though the board uh, does want to urgently review the care that Amanda received to ensure that all appropriate lessons are learned and I know that they are in close contact with Amanda's family to ensure that they are kept informed while the review is carried out. But Christine Graham is absolutely right uh, to say that that must be done appropriately and sensitively, given the fact that uh, Amanda's husband in particular is uh, deeply grieving uh, at this uh, time. And I will communicate uh, the concerns that Christine Graham has raised uh, back to NHS Lothian, who are also, uh, as I'm sure everybody would understand, very distressed uh, by the tragic circumstances that have unfolded. Um, the Health Secretary, of course, will keep uh, a very close watch on developments here, and I'm sure we'd be happy to discuss the matter with Christine Graham uh, as more information and facts and understanding of what happened here uh, comes to light. But in the meantime, I'm sure all of us right across the chamber uh, will want Amanda's family to know that our thoughts are with them at this impossibly difficult time. And Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister is aware that last week re we received the news that yet another business in Rossshire, Carbon Dynamic, has sadly gone into administration. Can the First Minister outline what help and support the Scottish Government can give the 40 staff that have been made redundant and any help to find a buyer for the business which still has a healthy order sheet? First Minister. Well, thank you to Gail Ross for raising uh, this situation. I am aware of uh, the position at Carbon uh, 
uh, dynamic uh, CLDB uh, Limited is the, the overall name of the company and I know that this will be an extremely anxious time for the staff working at the company, the families and the whole community. Uh, obviously the individuals affected by the announcement are our immediate priority uh, and we recognise the important role they play in the economy so we will do everything within our power to help those affected. Uh, the PACE team has already been in contact with KPMG to offer support to affected employees. Uh, KPMG issued uh, redundancy guides and information uh, of support to all uh, employees on Friday of last week uh, and they will continue to uh, provide skills development and employability support. Uh, the Economy Secretary will be very happy to uh, talk to and meet with Gail Ross to see if there is uh, further assistance that the Scottish Government can bring to bear. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Yesterday, the Scottish Government's Finance Secretary claimed that he was providing a real terms increase of more than £200 million to local services around the country, such as that mentioned by my colleague Andy Whiteman. But once again, this claim ignores the fact that the Scottish Government is forcing councils to use their resources to fund Scottish Government policies. Within hours of the budget being published, COSLA shared their analysis, showing that the reality was more than a £175 million cut, which they then re revised a few hours later again when they'd seen through some of the Scottish Government's sleight of hand. They're saying a £200 million cut. And then later, Parliament's independent research unit, whose impartial work sometimes shows the truth being somewhere between what the Scottish Government and local government say, they produced more detailed work saying the truth is more than a £300 million cut to local services. Councils around the country are now being forced to look at cuts to schools, social care, parks, libraries. Where does the First Minister think those cuts should fall? First Minister. Well, can I thank Patrick Harvey for uh, raising the issue. The uh, settlement, of course, that was uh, outlined by Derek Mackay yesterday it does deliver a real terms increase in both revenue and in capital funding uh, to local councils. Of course, that is before we take account of councils' own ability to raise revenue uh, through the council tax. Uh, yes, that does include funding that the Scottish Government has made available to increase uh, childcare, £210 million in revenue for childcare. It, yes, includes a transfer from health to help fund uh, social care. These are all important priorities, and it's absolutely right that the Scottish Government and local councils work together to ensure the delivery of these priorities. But I'm going to make the same offer to Patrick Harvey as I made to Richard Leonard. O on past form, Patrick Harvey will be more likely to step up to the plate on this than uh, Richard Leonard is likely to be. But we have allocated, we have allocated all of the resources at our disposal in this budget. I would like to do more for local government, for health, in a whole range of different areas. But if opposition parties want extra spending in some areas of the budget, then there is a duty to say what areas of the budget they think that money should come from. We are happy to have those constructive discussions. As I say, I think we're probably more likely to have them with Patrick Harvey and his colleagues than uh, with other parties in the chamber. Uh, but they have to be hard-headed discussions because uh, we can't create money out of nowhere. So I look forward to having these discussions in the weeks to come. Patrick Harvey. Uh, I haven't for a moment suggested that the new national policies are, are bad policies or inappropriate. They are important. But if they're national policies, they should be funded from national resources, not from a raid on council budgets. Nor was there a word yesterday in the statement about fairer local taxation. Nothing about genuine steps toward a replacement for the broken, unfair council tax, which the Scottish Government claims that it wants to end, and nothing about new ideas to help councils raise money in new ways to fund the services that are needed. The Scottish Government does keep saying that they're open to dialogue on these issues, but we've been trying to have that dialogue on the basis of detailed proposals since the end of the, the last budget process uh, at the start of this year. The question is not who's going to step up and have dialogue. The question is when are we going to hear some kind of response from the Scottish Government? When will they show any hint of urgency and leadership, even in making their own policy on council tax a reality? First Minister. Well, 
firstly, let me answer this question in, in two parts. In terms of the spending uh, decisions we've made in the budget, in terms of national priorities, we have given extra money uh, to local government to meet uh, the costs of these priorities. And on spending, and this is simply uh, a statement of fact, if any opposition party wants us to spend more in a particular area, they have to also tell us where they think we should spend less. That's a, a simple statement of uh, arithmetic. On the issue of uh, local tax reform, yesterday we set out our tax and spending decisions. That's the appropriate thing to do when we publish the draft budget. There have already been discussions, I know, between Patrick Harvey and his colleagues and the Finance Secretary about uh, tax reform. Derek Mackay is keeping me updated on those. We would expect those discussions to continue. And I very much hope that we can come to an agreement around that that does see a commitment to local tax reform and a greater commitment to devolution of tax power to local authorities. There is a willingness to do that. And in the normal way between now and the final votes in this budget, I'm sure we'll have lots of very productive, or at least I hope they will be productive discussions. I think a couple of further supplementaries. The first from Neil Findlay. Officer. Uh, the Scottish charity regulator Oscar states an organisation cannot continue to be a charity if it is set up to be or advance a political party it's, or its governing, uh, governing document allows it to use its assets for non-charitable purposes. Does the First Minister believe the Institute of Statecraft, based in Fife, should continue to be registered as a charity <coughs> excuse me, with Oscar, given the revelations this week that it has been engaged and partisan political activity. First Minister. Well, I was, I, I was <coughs> concerned uh, about the revelations that were published in the Sunday Mail on Sunday. Uh, clearly, uh, those re revelations involved uh, alleged uh, actions of the Foreign Office, and therefore it, it's not for me to investigate the veracity or otherwise, but certainly on the face of it, it was uh, a concerning report. Um, and I hope we do see full investigation and full answers to questions that people will rightly and understandably have. Um, on the question about uh, the Oscar and uh, whether or not an organisation is a charity, I, I, absolutely understand uh, the sentiment behind Neil Finlay's question and why he's asking me that, but uh, I know he will also appreciate that Oscar takes these decisions independently and it's right that it does so, and I'm sure Oscar uh, keeps the charitable status of a whole range of organisations uh, under review if concerns are raised about them, and I would encourage him, uh, if he does, as he clearly and understandably does have concerns about this, perhaps to raise those concerns directly with Oscar. And Maurice Corrie. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, road traffic accidents in Scotland have increased by 7% as reported this morning in The Lancet since the introduction of the Scottish Government's lower alcohol level limits for drivers in 2014. First Minister, is this a direct result of yet another failed SNP Government policy? First Minister. So, well... During the festive season, that's irresponsible. But yes. just let me... As I... As I recall, uh, when this parliament decided to lower the drink driving limit, it did so unanimously, uh, which obviously must mean that the Conservatives supported that. And credit to the Conservatives for supporting that, because uh, you know, I don't think it can reasonably be said that road traffic accidents are increasing because we've cut the drink driving limit. That makes uh, no sense. But can I say, uh, in all seriousness uh, right now, we are uh, in the festive season. Uh, at this time of year, we should do this at every time of year, but it, particularly at this time of year, the message that should come unanimously uh, from all of us to everybody across Scotland is do not drink and drive. And I find it uh, deeply regrettable that today, as we go into the Christmas period, we have a Conservative MSP standing up, somehow seeming to suggest that lowering the drink driving limit was a bad thing to do. I hope he will reflect very seriously on the question he's just asked. Question number four, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what progress the Scottish Government is making in delivering the Best Start Grant. First Minister. Well, I'm pleased to say that we are now delivering the Best Start Grant Pregnancy and Baby Payment. 
Uh, by the end of the first day on Monday, more than 4,000 claims had been submitted, which is an exceptional response and an important moment for Social Security Scotland. Uh, the payment will provide £600 on the birth of a first child, which is £100 more than the UK system it is replacing. Uh, the first payments will be made before Christmas, as promised, and will begin to reach bank accounts next week. We've also extended eligibility and the application window, and unlike the current DWP system, we will not put a cap on children. Uh, so we have introduced our 300 payment for second and subsequent children. Uh, as a very significant number of claims submitted in the first days shows, our work to encourage take-up of this benefit for low-income families is paying off, and I am delighted that we are using our new social security powers to provide improved financial support for all of the children of low-income families. Claire Adamson. First, I am delighted to hear that so many people have applied for the new Scottish Government benefit. It will greatly help many of my constituents in Motherwell and Wisha. Does the First Minister agree that this grant is another example clearly demonstrating that if this SNP Government believes Social Security is there as a safety net, supporting people on low incomes and encouraging benefit take-up, in sharp contrast, contrast sorry, to the shameful othering of benefits those in benefits perpetrated by the Conservative Government? Yeah, yeah, First Minister. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I agree with that. I think the uh, fantastic response to the Best Start grant is a clear sign that people know that Scottish Social Security will be different from the current UK system. Uh, we see Social Security as an investment in our people. We're doing all we can to make sure that people get the financial support they're entitled to, which of course includes encouraging them to apply for this new benefit. Our communication alongside that of stakeholders is focused on new parents and importantly families who would not have received uh, a UK Sure Start maternity grant for the child because uh, they were not the first born. Uh, these are families who know that they can be supported by our Best Start grant and so we expect a significant proportion of applications will be for second children. And that is important because this government is determined to give all children the very best start in life. Question number five, Annie Wells. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to a recent survey which suggests that 51% of teachers believe that their job has a detrimental impact on their mental health. First Minister. Well, we <clears throat> recognise the pressures and challenges facing teachers such as those highlighted by the Mental Health Foundation in Scotland. Uh, that's why we've uh, taken action to reduce teacher workloads, clarify and simplify the curriculum framework and remove unnecessary bureaucracy. We also continue to take forward a range of actions to support the mental health of both teachers and children and young people. These include delivering specific resources for mental health education to teachers across Scotland and providing mental health first aid training for schools. Annie Wells. I thank the First Minister for that answer. From the survey carried out by the Mental Health Foundation, it's clear that teachers are under immense pressure, with more than seven out of 10 saying they lack the skills to support pupils with mental health problems. And on top of this, total teacher numbers are down by more than 3,000 since the SNP came to power, heaping additional workload and pressures with serious implications for their wellbeing. And I welcome the commitment to see counsellors and mental health nurses in school. However, when will we see a delivery plan for counselling and mental health training in schools, as I have repeatedly called for, and what action will be taken to drastically improve current vacancy numbers? First Minister. Well, firstly, in terms of teacher numbers, of course, we had uh, the recent statistics about teacher numbers published on Tuesday of this week. Uh, they, know, they showed uh, that teacher numbers this year were up 447 on the previous year. There are now more teachers uh, working in our schools than at any time since 2010, and primary teacher numbers are now at their highest level since 1980. That's when I was still uh, at primary school. So teacher numbers uh, are rising. Since I became First Minister, teacher numbers have increased by more than 1,200 uh, in Scotland. Of course, teachers still work under uh, significant pressure. Uh, and one of those pressures, of course, is uh, dealing with young people with mental health issues. That's why we have announced the plans uh, to put more counsellors into schools and also to improve training uh, for teachers. Uh, all of us need to become more mental health uh, aware. The mental health minister will set out uh, the further details of that, including the timeline uh, in due course uh, and uh, indeed soon. Uh, and I hope th these are measures that all of parliament will get behind. Question number six, Jackie Bailey. To ask the first minister, how many people will be taken out of fuel poverty in 2018-19? 
First Minister. Well, the national measurement of fuel poverty is based on the annual Scottish House Conditions Survey, uh, so the 2018 rate will not be published until December 2019. Uh, the most up-to-date statistics we have for 2017 show that since 2013, fuel poverty has reduced by 11 percentage points from 36% to 25%, which is a reduction of almost 250,000 households. However, despite fuel poverty levels now being at their at lowest since 2005, it is unacceptable that around 25% of households are still in fuel poverty, which is why we're taking action on energy efficiency and fuel poverty. By the end of 2021, we will have committed more than a billion pounds since 2009, making homes warmer and fuel bills lower, and over 120,000 homes uh, have benefited through our home energy efficiency programmes since 2013. Jackie Bailey. There are more than one in four people in Scotland living in fuel poverty, and for an energy-rich country, that is a national scandal. In that context, the First Minister's target of ending fuel poverty by 2040 is deeply unambitious. More than a decade ago, Energy Action Scotland told the Scottish Government that it needed to spend £200 million a year if it was serious about wanting to end fuel poverty. Yet the latest budget only provides about half that amount and 30 million of that is financial transaction funding which requires to be repaid. As we face the prospect of a very cold winter, will the First Minister adopt a greater degree of urgency, bring forward the date by which fuel poverty will end in Scotland and stop the scandal of older people having to choose between eating and heating? First Minister. Well, firstly, uh, there is urgency on the part of the Scottish Government. I repeat again, uh, we've seen uh, a number of households, uh, almost 250,000 households moved out of fuel poverty and the rate reduced uh, between 2014 and 2017, which is not uh, enough. I, I don't want to uh, live in a country where 25% of households live in fuel poverty. That's why we have set uh, ambitious, but what we consider to be deliverable targets, as well as the 20 40 targets. Uh, our route map outlines minimum standards for the private rented sector from April 2020, which will be the first time the private rented sector has been regulated. And next year, we'll introduce regulations for all PRS properties to reach energy efficient band D by April 20. 25, and we've consulted on increasing that standard uh, to require Band C by 2030, and we'll confirm next steps on that measure next year. So we are determined to take the action necessary. Lastly, Presiding Officer, on the funding point, I will make the same point that I have made repeatedly already today. If any member of this uh, Parliament, as we move into the next stages of this budget, wants us to spend more on particular areas, we will listen. Uh, we will be constructive and we will listen to all ideas, but they must come uh, with also the suggestions of where in our fully allocated draft budget that money comes from. And I look forward to hearing these proposals in due course. Thank you very much. That concludes First Minister's questions. Can I just say before members go, I made an appeal last week for members for short questions, succinct answers. Uh, I appeal again this week. I have to say, I don't think members are listening. I've written, I've spoken to business managers, I've written to ministers, I've written to members. Can I please ask you, I'm not going to uh, become overly interventionist overnight, but unless these questions and answers are short and succinct, I will cut members off, I will cut members off and make sure we get through more members, more questions. So please listen to my advice. Thank you. Now we're going to move on to members' business in the name of Willie Rennie on St Andrew's GP out of hours facility. Well, before we do that, we'll just have a short suspension to allow uh, the gallery to clear and to allow members and the ministers to change seats. <laughs>